Good morning. It's great to see you. Thank you for taking time to join with us on this Remembering Sunday. In a moment, we're going to observe the two minute silence with the rest of the country as we acknowledge all those who gave their lives for our freedom. The freedom we have to here to gather this morning, the ability we have to meet together freely and worship God came at a cost for others. And so we're going to take a moment to acknowledge people gave their lives for our freedom and to acknowledge that there are wars and conflicts currently going on where people are losing their lives. So let's stand together as we remember them. this morning <coughs> for the liberty we enjoy Lord we're grateful that we can gather this morning freely to worship you that we live our lives in freedom and that we have known peace in our lifetime Lord we recognize this morning that there are many who gave up their freedom <coughs> for ours, that there are those who lay down their lives so that we might be free to gather, to worship, to live our lives freely. And so Lord, we say thank you this morning as we remember them. And Lord, we commit all those who are grieving today to you. We ask, would you be near to the brokenhearted God and those who are crushed in spirit? We recognize that all across the face of the earth this morning, there are wars happening that don't get our full attention, that we live ignorant of often. Lord, we commit all those fighting to you we ask, would you reveal yourself to them? Would you save them by your grace? God, we pray for all those who seek to cause conflict 
and chaos in situations? Would your kindness lead them to repentance, God? Would you open up their eyes that they might see your glory? And Lord, for all those displaced by war or deep feeling the loss of it, we pray, would you draw near to them? Would you enrich their lives in every way? For those who are in a new place and trying to settle, we pray, God, that they would find a spacious place they can call home, where they are enriched in every way. Lord, we thank you this morning that you paid the ultimate sacrifice for us, that it was for freedom that Christ set us free. And as we remember this morning, we acknowledge that you loved us with an everlasting love and gave yourself up for us. So we say this morning, be blessed in this place. Be magnified in our midst. Glorify yourself amongst us, we pray, as we lift your name high. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we worship together? Oh, oh, oh. 
Lord, we've come to bless your name this morning. To give you the highest praise. Lord, as we acknowledge those who have done good on our behalf, we've come to worship the one who's always good. As we celebrate the faithfulness of others, we've come to acknowledge you're always faithful. You never change and you never fail. And Lord, as we remember, we say thank you. Lord, as we think of how our lives were going and where we were headed, we're grateful you intervened. We're thankful that you reached down into the mess of our lives and you've lifted us out of a pit and set our feet upon a rock that you call us your own this morning, that we are children of the most high God. We say thank you. And Lord, as we look to uncertain futures, we ask, would you remind us of your faithfulness? As we look to a world that seems to be in chaos, we recognize you are the Prince of Peace. That you're a God of order, not disorder. And so Lord, we ask, would you bring change and transformation to those situations? But even while we wait, help us to know your faithfulness, God. Help us to be assured of your goodness. Help us to be confident that everything you've purposed will stand. That not one of your plans is going to fail. That you've begun a good work in us and you are seeing it through the completion. So be glorified, we say in Jesus' name. Be magnified in our sight. Speak to our hearts and transform our lives, we pray, for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Please feel free to take your seats. If you're a child and you're heading out to Children's Church, now's your moment. It's great to see you. I'm going to read from John chapter 13, if you want to turn there. John 13, verse 1 says it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Then he came to Simon and Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realise now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For this is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. For those of you who weren't here at 
11 o'clock. It's Remembrance Sunday, and that's probably why some of you got me to gather in the foyer while we observed the two minute si silence. And the Royal British Legion set a theme for Remem Remembrance Sunday each year. And the statement on the website this year says, in 2023, we are remembering and honouring service. Service, the act of defending and protecting the nation's democratic freedoms and way of life, is rarely without cost for those who serve. Physical, mental or emotional injury or trauma, the absence of time with loved ones or the pressures that come from serving, highlight why the remembrance of service is so important. And they wanted to take time to draw people's attention to the service of those who seek to defend and protect the, de the nation's democratic freedoms and way of life. But as I was thinking about the word service, I was reminded of John 13, where Jesus, sitting at the Last Supper with his disciples, recognizing he's about to face the cross, knowing one of his friends is there, about to betray him, gets up and starts washing their feet. And I've been in church for a while. So on a couple of occasions, people have decided to take the example of Jesus and wash my feet. And it's been the weirdest thing in the world. They've demanded I remove my shoes and socks, sort of half-heartedly patted my feet in a weird caress sort of way, and then left them semi-dry for me to put my damp foot back into a sock and put my shoe back on. And it's all been a bit odd. But foot washing actually had value when Jesus did it for the disciples. They're walking through dirt roads in sandals, their feet are getting dirty, and then they recline at a table where their feet are very prominent whilst they eat. And so the expectation is that when you arrive at a destination or somebody's home, your feet are washed. It was a necessity and a standard practice of hospitality. So in Luke 7, when the woman comes to anoint Jesus for the alabaster jar at the home of Simon the Pharisee, Jesus, in trying to explain the actions of the woman to Simon, in verse 44, says he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. The expectation was that when you arrived at places, people gave you water for your feet. That there was somebody there to wash your feet. But it wasn't standard for the guest or for a person of prominence to wash feet. It was the expectation that the lowliest of servants did it. And you see Peter's resistance and embarrassment to Jesus approaching him to watch his feet in verses 6 to 8, right? Jesus came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing now, but you will later. Peter said, no, you shall never wash my feet. He's uncomfortable with it. This isn't Jesus's role in this moment as far as Peter's concerned. This is the wrong way around. If anything, the disciples should be washing his feet. It's not how it's meant to go. But Jesus demonstrates his character as a servant and gets up and washes the feet of the disciples. And I talked to you last week about the Good Samaritan and the Samaritan interrupting his journey to show love to the, the man who'd been attacked, to setting his own agenda aside. So let me try and draw your attention to this. Jesus is about to go to the cross, and
and he knows it. Verse 1, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. It's clear from what follows the Last Supper in Gethsemane, he's not enjoying it. He feels the pain of it. He describes himself as his soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He pleads with the Father, if there was any other way, let this cup pass from me. And he knows in that moment he's sitting with somebody who's going to betray him. In 24 hours, Jesus is going to be hung on a cross, crucified, feels the weight of that, knows his friend is going to hand him over. This would be a great time to get all up in your feelings. This would be a, a good moment to ignore what everybody else is doing and just sit and feel sorry for yourself. Let me suggest, if it was me in that moment, I would very much just be feeling for me. The dirtiness of other people's feet would be the last of my concern. It would be a time, as far as I'm concerned, to sit and just feel sorry for yourself. He's got some stuff to deal with. And yet he washes their feet. And I think at times we tell ourselves when life's okay, we'll be able to do that love thing for other people. But right now I've got some stuff going on and I'm in the midst of something. So I need to forget about them because I've got some stuff to deal with for me. I'm going to tell you that's not the example Jesus set in John 13. That when he's got stuff to deal with, he's still thinking about them and serving them. That when a big thing's happening in his life, his consideration is towards the disciples and setting them an example of service. Sometimes in order to get an idea of what people enjoy, you ask the question, if you had 24 hours to live, what would you do? And there's all sorts of answers about the food you might eat, the places you might go, the people you might go and see. But Jesus knows he's got 24 hours to live and he washes feet. What Jesus exemplifies for me is that loving and serving others isn't a fair weather task. It isn't supposed to happen at my convenience or in the absence of challenge but in spite of them that yes I've got stuff going on in my life and there's stuff to deal with for me and I'm confronted with all of these emotions and feelings and there's stuff that doesn't seem to be happening right but I don't neglect you in that moment I still serve you I still honour you That in the moment where it would be easy to be self-centred, I serve you extravagantly. And the expectation of Jesus is that you do likewise. Verse 14, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. 
Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Philippians 2 and verse 3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the other. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And it's interesting that what Luke 22 tells us in this moment is that the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest. They've gathered with Jesus at the Last Supper and they're talking amongst themselves about who's most important. That's their conversation. Who's best here? Which one of us is the greatest? And some commentators suggest that's the reason why nobody's feet has been washed up until the point that Jesus does it. Because they're busy vying for position amongst each other. Which one of us is more important? I'm not going to wash your feet. You think you're better than me? What's interesting to me most about this passage is verses 3, 4, and 5. Let me read them to you again. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he was from God and returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. Some of your versions will say, Jesus knowing that the Father had put all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was returning to God, got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped the towel around his waist. Jesus' understanding of his identity and power is the thing that allows and causes him to serve them. Jesus' understanding of his identity and power is the thing that allows and causes him to serve them. Jesus knew the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to, to God. So he got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. It's because he knows the power he has, where he's from and where he's going, that washing their feet changes nothing. Right? It doesn't make him less because he already has a clear understanding of the power he has, a clear understanding of who he is, where he's from and where he's going. So it's not going to degrade him in any way. It's not going to make him less. It's not going to undermine him in any way because he knows who he is already. And I'm going to say to you that the assurance of the power that's available to you and at work within you and a clear understanding of your identity is the thing that allows you to serve. See, the disciples are debating who's the greatest amongst them because they don't know. They don't know. So there's something to prove in the unknown. 
Does that make sense? Because I don't know if you're better than me, then I've got something to prove. Because I'm not sure where I stand in the rankings. Then I've got something to demonstrate about whether or not I'm better than you, about who I am. It becomes a debate because there is uncertainty around it. But when you know who you are and where you stand, there's nothing to debate. I am a child of God this morning. I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. I am an heir and co-heir with Christ. I'm going to reign with him in eternity. If I know that, I've got nothing to prove to you about my importance. I've got nothing to demonstrate to you about how great I am. Because I know my identity already. I know where I've come from. He formed me in my mother's womb. He knit me together. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. I know where I've come from and I know where I'm going. This earth is not my home. I'm going to see him one day and when I see him I will be like him. For I shall see him as he is. I'm not stopping here. And I know who I am. Ephesians 1 tells me there is incomparably great power available for us who believe. Ephesians 3.20 says now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or imagine according to the power that's at work within you. That sounds quite good. And if I get secure in that stuff, if I understand it and get hold of it, it makes it much easier to do the things that other people belittle. Because I've got nothing to prove. Because there is no debate this morning. Christ died for me. Nobody's going to add value to my life beyond that. I was bought with a price. It's already been determined. And I wholeheartedly believe that if you get hold of that, it changes your attitude and approach to some stuff. Because it doesn't matter if you're taking advantage of me. That's not going to dictate my worth this morning. If you're awful to me, I'm still his. N nothing you do is going to snatch me out of his hand. And rather than spending my life competing with you over an identity that's uncertain, I'd like to serve you out of a place that's assured. Does that make sense? That rather than trying to prove myself to you over an identity that doesn't seem clear,
I want to serve you from a place that I'm assured I know who I am in him. That my eternal identity is already secure. It doesn't matter. How low it is. I'm already seated higher than I can imagine. It doesn't matter how bad it seems. I have an eternity that's already better than I could dream of. And some of us were willing to do some stuff for some people. But there's a limit to it, right? Because I'm not going to let them think that of me. I'm not going to let them treat me like that. They can't come to expect this of me. That's not okay. Do they know who I am? Let me ask you, do you? Because very often when I want to tell people, do you know who I am? It's because I don't know who I am. And I need you to validate my identity. See, I want you to tell me how wonderful I am because I need you to make me feel better about myself. Because I don't know who I am. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? Apologies. But there's a reality in that. That I can get on my high horse at times. Not because I'm important, but because I'm not sure about myself and where I stand. That very often it's insecurity that drives the thing. Of pride. Because if... If I do that, what will they think of me? How will I be seen? If I allow this to happen, what will it do? To who I am? I'm going to tell you absolutely nothing. You're already his. You're already his. And so while the disciples want to argue about who's the greatest amongst them, Jesus gets up knowing he has all power and authority. Knowing he's come from God and he's returning to God and washes their feet. And it's out of that place he washes their feet. And the disciples feel uncomfortable about it. Because they know it's not necessarily his place. But Jesus is in no way uncomfortable about it. And this is symbolic. Jesus tells Peter, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. One John one five says this is a message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we can confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Revelation 7 and verse 11. All the, angels, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom, thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, 
These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. I've been washed this morning. By his blood. He has cleansed me. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. It wasn't a result of me. But because of his grace, he saved me. And he's cleansed me. Matthew 20 verse 28 says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so I've been cleansed. Because Christ served me on the cross. That he didn't prioritize equality with God. That he wasn't vying for position, but he humbled himself and became obedient. And so as this Remembrance Sunday marks service, I wanted to draw your attention to John 13. Where Jesus demonstrated service and told us to do likewise. We're out of a secure identity about who he was and where he was going and where he was from. What he had, he got up while everybody else didn't and washed their feet. And I'm not inviting you this morning to go and get a basin and start washing people's feet here. Because that has no value today. Leave them wear their socks and have their feet be dry. Unless you've got sweaty feet and then they might not be so dry. But hey, that might just be me. Um... But actually, what's the stuff that people are fighting not to do? What's the stuff that seems beneath you? Is it? Is it? And some of you are walking through stuff. And the prospect of doing anything for anybody else seems ridiculous. But it's the example he set. So we're going to break bread together as we remember him. I'm going to ask Audrey and Chuck if they'll serve the communion to us. As we thank him for what he has done for us. I 
I want to ask you the question, what might you do to serve others? And eat and drink together. Oh 
secured for us something better than we could ever imagine. And we're grateful, Lord, that our identity isn't found in fleeting things. That we don't have to compete this morning to be your child. So Lord, help us to live out of the security of that place that you have chosen us, that you have loved us with an everlasting love, that you call us your own. And that you are at work in and through us for your glory. Lord, we do ask you would have your way in our lives. Help us, God, to love and to serve one another well. Help us as we seek to advance your kingdom here on this earth and be ambassadors for you. Be magnified in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. God bless you. It's great to see you and we'll see you soon.